All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, you all uh, coming here. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce today for our GP seminar Neela Creasy. Neela has a uh, she started her geophysics and seismology career uh, by getting a BS in applied geophysics from MTU, and then she went on to do a PhD at Yale with uh, her supervisor was Maureen Long. And her thesis was on the uh, sort of lower mantle anisotropy through the lens of uh, seismic observations and mineral physics experiments. And um, I, I hear that she actually won an AGU graduate student award for her thesis. So that's very impressive. Um, after her uh, graduate school, she went on to be a NSF EAR postdoctoral fellow at Colorado, Colorado School of Mines working with Ebru Bozdag, and I believe that the topic of um, her talk today is going to be on that work. Um, and then after uh, being at Colorado School of Mines, she went on to Los Alamos National, National Laboratory, where she is now a staff scientist. Um, so her research uh, interests cover a wide range of topics in seismology, including uh, deep earth seismology, shear wave splitting observations, and now some new interests in uh, explosion discrimination, subsurface imaging for the energy transition. But she tells me that uh, it's all governed by a passion for SPECFEM simulations. So I hope we'll hear all about that. But um, yeah, Neela, please take it away. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. So yeah, this topic is really about uh, yeah, my work at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, it took this paper and this research topic took a long time uh, to be published. There's like a whole story there. Um, but it's just because this turned out to be like a really interesting little study. And I did this with Avery Bozdek and Dan Frost. Uh, so Dan Frost is now a professor at University of uh, South Carolina. And Rolf Schneider, who is a professor at Colorado School of Mines as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. Okay, yeah, so originally the concept behind this work didn't start at, with Earth's Coriolis effect. I was originally interested in seismic anisotropy because my research was on the shear wave splitting or like the method to measure seismic anisotropy using these different seismic phases that propagate through, mainly through Earth's mantle and core uh, mostly they're called like SKS and SKKS phases. Um, so here's SKS, it's a shear wave that starts off at the source and then travels through uh, Earth's outer core, which is liquid. So it propagates as a P wave here and then an S wave up to the receiver. And this phase is, I will dive more into it and like why we use it for shear wave splitting. And I was trying to understand it by using SpecFin simulations, so global simulations of just this, just trying to understand the assumptions behind these measurements and are they actually appropriate? Because in my work in my PhD, I often used ray theoretical approximations. Um, and I think at the time, we didn't really fully understand how robust those approximations were. But now there's been a lot more research on like where those limitations are. So if you see any work from like Jonathan Wolf, he's a grad student of Maureen Long and he's done a lot of great work continuing on it. Um, so just here's just some observations of uh, shear wave splitting as a function of back azimuth for SKS. It can really vary. There's lots of heterogeneity. And that was like the driving force was, why is there all this heterogeneity? What, how can we understand it? Um, so I wanted to look at it from using full physics, for considering the full physics of wave propagation, because in reality, we think of SKS as this like simple ray path. But in reality, it's actually, there's a zone of sensitivity. So this is a finite frequency kernel that I calculated with SpecFim. So this is the uh, time uh, the time sensitivity kernel of, of this particular SKS at 10 seconds. So 10 seconds is usually around the dominant period that we use for these measurements. And so you could see actually the zone of sensitivity is quite large. And so that's why I was considering the full physics of wave propagation. And that's where it originally came from. So I used SpecFin Globe. 
So Spectrum Globe is an open source tool uh, that uses parallel computing, so you can run on high performance computing uh, clusters. And it takes into account a lot of uh, things that we discount when we do like ray theoretical approximations in my previous work. You can consider attenuation, you consider ocean load, uh, crustal variations, uh, as well as topography and rotation and ellipticity. And it was actually this rotation effect that um, is what I really noticed uh, when conducting this work. And of course, you can also model different Earth models as well. We can model uh, PREM, just the standard 1D um, Earth model, but we can also implement 3D tomography models as well. So we can even look at heterogeneity in Earth's mantle. And so these were the models that I considered um, during this study. Uh, so I considered S4TRTS and um, GLADIM15. So GLADIM15 is one of the first global full waveform inversion models uh, that were conducted. And so it uses a very different approach than the S4TRTS model. And you can already see that there are significant differences in these models. And I wanted to see the influence of the heterogeneity on these different phases that we use for shoe wave splitting. And so to conduct this research, I just started off by calculating uh, synthetic seismograms using Spectrum Globe. I used uh, a global array of seismometers. So those are these red ones here. And then I selected about 20 or so earthquakes, like a relatively even distribution. So these are their earthquakes and their depths and their locations. And I used real moment tensors from the global moment tensor catalog. So I wanted to simulate uh, realistic earthquakes as well. And I calculated these down to nine second seismograms um, for more than a thousand uh, stations. And I wanted to really focus in on this SKS phase that we use for shearing splitting. And then this is the distance range that uh, we see it on receivers. And then I considered the PREM 1D model and compared it to the two, I compared it to S4 TRTS, the global model, as well as with a the CRUST 2.0, and then the GLADIN 15, which is the global full waveform inversion model. And so here's just a snapshot of like what these synthetics look like. And remember, these are noise-free, so they're absolutely like almost perfect. Uh, we don't have any noise to worry about. This is typically what the waveforms look like for SKS. So here's the radial component. I have it centered on the SKS phase here. And you can see this strong signal coming in. That is the S diffracted phase. That's the shear wave that diffracts along the core mass boundary. That's very strong amplitudes. And these different waveforms represent the three different models that I'm showing. Um, so you can already see how much just the mantle heterogeneity alone influences the waveform shape. Um, Comparatively. And now on the transverse component, remember, these are all isotropic. So very simple. We don't have a lot of transverse component energy. It's mostly in this S, S diffracted phase here that's present. Um, this isotropic Earth. So SKS is mainly has energy on the radial component. It doesn't have any, really any energy on the transverse component. So I'm just showing you a snapshot of what that looks like. And so for shear wave splitting, what we measure typically is this fast direction and delay time. So if you have like an anisotropic material, uh, you'll get this biofringence of the shear wave. So it'll split into two phases, one that's really aligned with the fast direction and one that's aligned with the slow. And then it will accumulate and you'll accumulate this DT, this offset in time between those two wavelengths. And now this is really important for SKS. So I showed SKS is mostly on the radial component. So if you imagine this radial component energy being going through anisotropic material, it'll split and you'll get, as a result, you'll get transverse component energy. So as I'm showing here, there's no transverse component energy because all these models I'm doing are isotropic. So that should be what we expect. And so when we look at SKS splitting with real data, here's an example of 
We call this apparent isotropy. So it's a, it, it looks isotropic. So uh, SKS energy, there should only be energy on the radial component and no energy on the transverse component. And when you look at the particle motion, so this is the north component plotted against the east component, the particle motion is completely linear and it's oriented with the, in the great circle plane. So it's pointing like a straight arrow at the back azimuth. And, but if we see the presence of anisotropy, call it apparent anisotropy, um, we'll see now there's energy on the transverse component. And you get, ignore the red line. So let's look at the blue line. The blue line is the actual data. Uh, the blue line is the particle motion of the, of the SKS. So we get this elliptical motion that we typically see with like SKS splitting. And that's what we'll measure. We'll measure the fast direction and the delay time. There are like a number of techniques. There's many different ways to, to measure it. But you can see that the long axis of this ellipse is still aligned with the great circle plane. That's this like light gray line here. It's aligned with the, the back atom. So it should still be. Okay. So just to summarize, in the isotropic case, we should see no transverse component energy, should be almost zero, but if we see pair anisotropy, there should be energy on the transverse component. So that is what I'm looking for in the synthetics is, could there be other sources causing energy on the transverse component uh, that we need to consider? And this is important because at the core mantle boundary, because SKS, it, it, it is a P to an SV conversion at the core mantle boundary because SKS travels as a P wave through the Earth's outer core and it's a liquid. But then at the core mantle boundary here, it converts to an SV wave and a P wave. So this conversion is called is the SKS phase. And this version would be called the SKP phase. And so that's also a phase that you can see. And because of that conversion, because we're converting to SV, that's why we should see no transverse component energy. Um, and so this is really important in certain measurement techniques we use for shear wave splitting that this assumption holds that we just have this pure P to SV conversion at the core mantle boundary. And this is important because in this, in the transverse minimization method, this method was developed to measure shear wave splitting. And it's under this assumption that the SKS is perfectly aligned in the back as of it. And based on that. So it's, really important. It finds the best solution. It tests, it does a grid search of every fast direction and delay time to find the lowest transverse energy. Uh, so that's what it's solving for. That's what we're doing with serious splitting is we're trying to correct for the anisotropy. So we do this grid search over all possible parameters and we try to remove it from the signal. And so this is a really important assumption in this particular method. Um, so, so when I did my simulations, I found a really interesting observation. Um, so I, I conducted this, I did an explosive source. So an explosive source, in theory, if you're in a perfect isotropic Earth, there should be no S waves produced. There's only P waves. So all of your conversions, if there's no topography, all of your conversions at interfaces should be P to SV conversions. So you should have no transverse component energy at all. Um, so in this case, the, I am looking now at a similar phase to SKS, but it's called PKS. I can't look at SKS in this case because there's no shear wave. So, but we can look at the PKS. So the PKS starts as a P wave at the source. It's a P wave through the outer core, and then it's a shear wave again. So we see this beautiful PKS here. I have it centered. I have the radial component centered on the PKS phase. I have it windowed right here so you can see it. Um, and there's also the PP arrival as well. That's here as well, the PP phase. You can see that as well in the radial component. But when you look at the transverse component energy, there's energy coming in under the PKS. But in practice, there should be no energy here. But I see energy and it's only on certain paths. It's only, I only see this energy on north-south paths going along Earth's rotation not not east-west. So this is like my first kind of 
observation of doing these tests, like why am I getting energy on the transverse component? So when you look at its polarization, um, you like similar to the polarization plots I showed earlier for SKS, the polarization should be aligned with the back azimuth. So when you plot it, this is the polarization here of this phase I'm showing. And you can see it's misaligned by 2.2 degrees. But there, as you can see, there's no elliptical motion. So we don't have any apparent anisotropy, which is good because this is isotropic. But we do see this misalignment. And so there's something about the PKS where it's rotating out of its plane. So it is actually creating some SH energy. There's some kind of coupling. And as a result, it's Earth's rotation because there is a directional impact on this. Where if you look at, so I'm showing here as an example. So I have uh, an event in the north and an event in the south, and I'm plotting their polar opposites. You get a flipped polarity. So if if a wave is traveling to the south, it'll have an opposite polarity to the north when you look at the transverse component. They're completely flipped in their alignment. And so these are the resulting polarizations as well, uh, where you get the rotation will be opposite depending on the propagation relative to Earth's rotation. Um, so just like zooming in on that, yeah, you can see the transverse component. The radial component is identical. The north explosion and the south explosion, they have identical radial uh, waveforms, but their transverse components are flipped. And for the stationary Earth, if I turn rotation off, because you could just, I can just make the Earth be stationary in these simulations. It has absolutely zero uh, transverse component entry, which is what we expected. So um, I wanted to like dig into this more, like, okay, well, what are the implications? Can we see this on other shear waves as well? So um, this is now SKS. So for this is, like this is using an earthquake source. So we now get shear waves. So here's the SKS phase, this is the radial component of SKS. Um, and then, but down here, here's the transverse component. So I did multiply the amplitudes by 10, just so you can see it better. Um, so it's it's small, it's not a huge amplitude, but there is energy here. And the rotating earth is plotted in red and the non-rotating earth is plotted in blue. And so you can actually see a significant difference um, between those two cases. And you can also see this here for SKKS. That's the green phase here. The KKS is similar to SKS. It just has another bounce point in the outer core. And then also you see a way, uh, change in, for, this is S diffracted. So S diffracted is a shear wave that diffracts along the core mental boundary. So you can already see like a huge waveform change there. So this is not just affecting PKS, it's, it's affecting every shear wave. And so you can see that here I'm plotting the the polarization anomaly. So that's plotting the, the north component versus the east component and calculating the polarization and its deviation from the back azimuth. This is for prim with no rotation in blue and then prim with rotation. So you can see most of the offsets are when the azimuths are mostly north-south. So when the phases are traveling along Earth's rotation. And there's also a source effect too. So when um, along certain azimuths, just because of the earthquake source I use, there's not really strong shear waves. So like, for example, here, there's really a low, this is this is radial component energy down here versus azimuth from the earthquake versus arc distance. So you can see like certain azimuths, I get very low radial component energy. So my polarization measurements aren't as reliable along these azimuths because it's just the source that I'm using. But um, so you can really see the, the difference. And it's about two degrees. It's not a lot. Um, it's about the same as PKS. PKS is 2.2 degrees. The one I showed and SKS is showing about two degrees. So it's not a lot, but there's definitely something measurable. And so there was a previous paper. Um, I know this is, a, this is an out of date. <laughs> um, my paper is not under revision, it's now published, but this paper, Sneeder in 2016, um, looked at P waves because for the P waves, we were only seeing the changes for the S waves. 
And P waves are not really impacted significantly at all by Earth's rotation. So they looked at real data. This is the TA array. And they looked at the P wave um, beam forming. They looked at the, the, the direction it was coming in from. And they looked at the P wave, the initial arrival here, and then a P wave, some kind of P wave reflection, like eight or nine hours later, and they could find no difference. So, and we also did the same. We did some beam forming as well. Uh, we just did a synthetic array, looks like in New Mexico. And we did um, beam forming comparisons as well because we see this polarization rotation of the S wave. So does that my question was, okay, is that shear wave coming in at a different angle then? Like, is the wave front being deflected? And so we did this beam forming with the synthetics and we actually find no deflection of the S wave front. So the wave front, is not being deflected. It's just the polarization. Um, so because we wanted to evaluate like, well, will that affect back azimuth estimation? Um, and it doesn't. So that's what we're showing here is that these are the the uh, beam the beams here showing here and then the stacks of um, this is the back azimuth stack uh, versus time for the rotating case and the non-rotating case. And we could find no difference um, between the two. So that agrees with this previous study as well. Like there's no deflection of the wave. Front. And so when we think about like the Coriolis effect, most seismologists would feel like know that there's an impact on normal modes. Like you can see the effect of rotation on normal mode modeling and also surface waves. There is uh, an influence on surface waves. Like this paper also from Colorado School of Mines, uh, looked at the rotation effect on surface waves. And there is also an impact there. You do get SVSH coupling, so Rayleigh, Rayleigh wave and love wave. Um, it's also very minimal, like it's small, but it is uh, detectable. And so you know, since I observed this effect, um, yeah, I went into the literature and um, just calling back to this Sneeder paper from 2016. So this is really, um, the best paper I could find because they actually derived uh, the polarization effect of the Coriolis force. So someone already did all the theory behind this and it just happened to be Rolf Sneeder who was also a professor at Colorado School of Mines. And so I ended up working with him because he already developed all the theory behind this of uh, this polarization effect that I observed in the synthetics. And so I highly recommend reading this paper. It's a really great read. Um, it's he calls it that S waves move like a focal pendulum. So if you're familiar with the pendulum in like a science museum, how it slowly moves because of Earth's rotation, well, S waves are operating like the same way, that with Earth's rotation, the S waves are slowly rotating out of alignment. Um, and that's defined with this equation here. So this equation defines the polarization effect. It's really simple. Um, so this is the polarization rate change. So it's how much your polarization is changing uh, over time. And then this is Earth rotation. And then this is the angle. And the angle is defined here. It's the angle between your ray path and the Earth's rotation. So you just calculate that angle. And boom, it's really easy. You can um, calculate the polarization rate effect. Um, and he actually, in his paper, he actually demonstrated uh, he looked at at uh, the ethnet array in Japan. He looked at two sources that were like, one was in the north and one was in the south. And he measured SCS and could actually find the flipped polarity that I also saw in my spectrum simulation. So he was able to demonstrate this with real data back in 2016. It's just, I think people just didn't know about it as much. It just didn't get a lot of recognition. And so, I wanted to kind of explore it further because I saw it impacting SKS. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I take that equation and I wanted to see if it would fit my measurements from my spectrum simulations. And it was like a perfect fit. This equation, I just applied 1D ray tracing and it's nearly a perfect fit with the polarization anomalies that I measure versus azimuth. And you can see like almost a perfect fit 
Um, so the, the red dots are my spectrum simulation measurements. And then the squares are the prediction. So, um, and I also looked at PCS as well, just another uh, shear wave. And then I also compared it uh, to SKS as well. I wanted to model SKS. So what's important here is that the Coriolis effect really only affects the shear wave from the core mental boundary to the receiver. Um, it doesn't affect the whole ray path because it's because of the conversion at the core mental boundary. So when, when it converts from an S to a P, it's just P wave energy and P wave isn't impacted by Coriolis effect and this the P wave to S. So it's really only this leg that is impacted by the Coriolis. So that's what I'm showing here is that the white squares are my spectrum results. And then the red are the just the predictions based on just assuming that the S wave here is being impacted. And then the blue is the source, like if just the source side was affected. And then the yellow would be if both S wave legs were being affected. So it's a perfect fit to the receiver side. So it it really only affects shear waves that are from whatever, like maybe a P to S conversion and then up to the receiver. So um, that's the only impact. And so I looked at uh, many other phases. Uh, these are the polarization anomalies from the back azimuth versus azimuth. And I'm only using an explosive source in this case. And it's for that same test case where I have an explosion in the north, an explosion in the south. And so the P wave is completely not affected, which is what was predicted. And I see that here. Uh, little PS um, is has strong polarization anomalies. Um, and then it says a function of distance. So the colors represent the arc distance. So the polarization anomaly effect is larger for like longer duration times. So the polarization effect accumulates over time. Um, and it actually can correct itself as well. So if you have a ray path going like over the North Pole, your overall polarization anomaly can actually be corrected as it goes against Earth's rotation. So it really depends on the ray path um, and its total path and its angle between Earth's rotation axis. So it it is highly dependent on that. So that's why you do have to do 1D ray tracing to actually get the prediction. And then PS, so PS is just a reflection. It's just a P and then it reflects off the Earth's surface and becomes an S. And then PCS is just P that's reflected off the core mantle boundary and comes back up as S. And then little PSKS and then PKS that I showed earlier. So there, every shear wave I looked at is, is impacted. And then also here's S diffracted. I showed this one earlier. So S diffracted is also um, impacted. You can see the, the slight waveform changes between the rotating case and the non-rotating case. And then here are the polarization anomalies. As well as for S-diff, it is impacted by its distance. Um, and, uh, and it really does depend on its location as well. Oh, and this paper also came out in uh, last year as well, uh, Jonathan Wolf. So I, this is also a really interesting paper about S-diffracted shear rate splitting as well, uh, which is another like great phase that could be used. So I wanted to see the effect on shear rate splitting. Um, Fortunately, there's fortunately in this case rotation, all it does is it causes the polarization of shear waves to deviate a little bit. So it just causes a misalignment, but it doesn't produce the elliptical motion that we're looking for with anisotropy. So it really doesn't like influence like the anisotropy measurement except the misalignment. And there has already been like extensive research on how misalignments affect shear wave splitting and have already been accounted for. So I didn't really have to do extensive research into how this is done because it's already been done. Um, but I did look at, I just measured shear wave splitting of all of my observations um, using like one of the methods, rotation correlation method, uh, just to see like if, if, if a shear wave splitter could be tricked, they can't be because your polarization is still linear. So if we see the linear particle motion, we think that's no, no anisotropy. So can't really trick it. 
So we see like very low delay times, which is expected. Um, usually like for something to be apparently anisotropic, its shear wave splitting has to be like above half a second. Um, and we really only see that at short distances. And we only see that because there are, there are other phases like S diffracted that's coming into the measurement window. So Earth's rotation is doing nothing here. It's not really impacting it. And so I'm just showing three different lines. It's just for different earthquake depths, like shallow, intermediate, deep. There's really nothing that we see that's significant and that will impact the wave splitting. So also we, we plotted if there was any correlation between the polarization anomaly and the shear wave splits that we measured from this data. So here's like arc distance of the SKS versus splitting intensity. So splitting intensity is just like another method. It should be zero in the no anisotropy case, and then it'll be like a higher number if they're splitting. Um, and overall, we see that, and I color it by the polarization anomaly. And I, we, I personally don't see any correlation. And then also if you apply here, this is splitting intensity. I also plot splitting intensity and delay time on the y-axis versus the polarization anomaly. And there's absolutely no correlation. Um, the most of the splitting intensities or delay times that are not zero are either from like another phase, it's in the measurement window, um, or it's it's not rotation. So it's there's no rotation effect on splitting except misalignment. That's it. Um, so this is just showing the same thing, but I, I compare to SKKS and PKS. So those are other phases. We also measure series splitting from these. And again, we just, we don't see anything like significantly greater than 0.5 seconds. So, um, there's really no impact of rotation, um, on splitting. Um, but the other thing I wanted to look at too was, um, 3D heterogeneity, because I also looked at those tomography models. So I'm just selecting here, this is just some data for four events. I selected four events in South America that were all at di different depths. Um, and so I'm just showing the comparison between, this is the polarization anomaly plotted on the Y and then versus az um, azimuth from the earthquake. And these are all the polarization measurements for SKS for PRIM and GLAD. So GLAD in 15 is the full waveformant version uh, global model. And once I filter out like the nodal planes of the earthquakes where I don't have very good SKS energy and I filter out the S diff coming in the measurement window, you can see the, uh, the Coriolis effect really well. Um, but when you look at the 3D uh, heterogeneous case, do you see that the 3D heterogeneity is adding some polarization anomalies as well? which is what we expect because you could get polarization anomalies from uh, velocity gradients um, as well. So this is something that, uh, that we expected to see. So we wanted to compare this. So these are actually previous studies that measured the polarization of, of SKS and SKKS seen in real data. So back in 2006, um, Restivo and Hilfrich, Hilfrich, they measured the polarizations of SKS um, and this is a histogram of their data. So this is the polarization anomaly. So it's how much it differed. Um, and you can see that some of these polarization angles, they go, they have some outliers at the 40 degrees, but their um, sigma value is around eight to 10 degrees, um, eight to 10 degrees. So, so much larger than you know, what we are seeing, just considering uh, the 3D mantle model and the Earth's rotation. But Walpole in 2014, they went back and measured thousands of SKS. Uh, I think it was around 10,000 uh, measurements of polarizations. And this is what they get. They get much fewer outliers out to 40 degrees and they get a sigma value closer to five to six degrees. So um, about half of what Restivo and Hilfrich saw. So they saw a significant smaller uh, number of polarization. So, I mean, still like our data for SKS, I have never seen an SKS anomaly like that high, really. Um, 
So one thing is that the Steve on Hellfresh, they tried to explain these polarization anomalies. Uh, one was looking at C and B topographies so or the core mantle boundary. So like if you have top topographic variations that can cause polarization anomalies as well. And they predicted to 50 hundreds of kilometer topographic variations were required to explain this. And they admit in their paper that like, it's probably not realistic. There are other mechanisms that could cause this because the core mantle boundary topography has been estimated with other methods and they get around like five kilometers is more reasonable. So, um, so this is a bit extreme, but maybe it's still possible we could look at core mantle boundary topography um, by considering like rotation and, and mantle heterogeneity. Okay. So, cause core mantle boundary topography has always been like a really hot topic in deep earth seismology. Um, and, and so it's, it's important for like the dynamics, like mantle core uh, relations and, and chemical reactions that could occur. Uh, so and there've been lots of estimates on it, like from using travel times, uh, stone limos is like one of the more recent ones, but the polarizations of SKS were always over predicting like hundreds of kilometers. But in reality, it's more like five to 10 kilometers, like this map is showing here, like that range. So given that there we have this newer data set that might be more reasonable with like what we see. Um, so this is, I'm sh now showing what we see with our data. So when we just consider SKS, I, um, I get a two sigma value of three degrees where the wall pulse study is like a two sigma of like 10.6. So just using PREM, it's really just the rotation effect that's impacting it. So it, obviously it can't explain all of the anomalies that are being seen. But when we look at GLADIN 15, we see a, a, like an extra degree. So mantle heterogeneity don't add significant like enough polarization anomalies to explain all of this. But I will warn you like GLADIN 15 is a very smooth model, very large features, and it only has a resolution down to 17 seconds. So if there are any like future uh, FWI models of the Earth mantle, um, we might be able to produce larger anomalies if we have smaller scale heterogeneity. So, so, so that's kind of like what we see. So we can't completely reproduce the 10 degrees. Um, but, oh, sorry, I didn't update these numbers, but yeah, these are should be higher. But we see here the influence of the 3D mantle heterogeneity effects on the polarization anomaly. So these are polarization anomalies versus azimuth. So you can see that the prim um, is more constrained and then the GLADIN 15 adds more heterogeneity. And then same with distance as well, we see overall that the mantle heterogeneity does add more polarization anomalies. So in the end, like when thinking about implications of the Coriolis effect, um, one possibility is like station misalignments. So SKS polarizations are sometimes used for station misalignments. Um, and we know that polarization anomalies can be up to like 10 degrees, 20 degrees. So um, might not, but I might be fine, like if you use like a global distribution of earthquakes, um, but it's just like an important consideration that it, it might, the SKS polarization might not always be able to work for station alignment. Might have to use like other phases just to confirm. Um, another thing is amplitude. So this is the S phase here and the SDS phase um, at this distance range. Um, and you can actually see that there are slight amplitude differences between the rotating case and the no rotation case. And so this could influence amplitudes, like anything that measures amplitudes or uses them for source inversions. But again, this only happens at teleseismic distances. Um, these differences become pretty much zero when you're within like 30 degrees of your source. So it's really only for teleseismic. Um, so lastly, here's my concluding slide is that 3D Earth heterogeneity, obviously, like based on fixed and simulations, can introduce polarization anomalies of pretty much like all S phases. 
Um, but the Coriolis effect by itself, it only introduces small errors in the splitting because of the misalignment of the polarization. Um, so maybe station corrections might need to consider it. Also, poor mental boundary topography, since we're like understanding more about how these polarization anomalies can arise, maybe we can estimate core mental boundary topography with polarizations now that we can, can correct for the Coriolis effect. And the Coriolis does not, is not going to fool a shear wave splitter. Doesn't look like shear wave splitting, uh, which is good. Um, so, so that's my funding source. Um, and, and I did all these computations on XSEED uh, as well, which is a high performance computing source. And then I also wanted to just kind of plug in at the end the that now on a staff scientist at Los Alamos. And um, if there are any interested graduate students or undergraduates or, or potential people who want postdocs, we have a lot of uh, job opportunities here. Um, uh, and they have like really good competitive salaries. And we do a lot more like applied work here at the lab too. So for example, this is a paper that just got published. So we also do underground hydrogen storage, geologic carbon storage, as well as S-wave generation from explosions. And we also do high resolution spectrum modeling. And then also I still am working a little bit on the inner core. So I'm not completely done with the deep earth. Um, so, so if there are any interested students, they can, they can email me and I can put my email in the chat and I can share. Um, the opportunities that we have. So that's it. That's my presentation. I'll take any questions. Thanks, Neela. Let's yeah. give her uh, some. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. Thanks so much for that. Um, yeah, let's uh, open up the floor for questions. Or perhaps uh, since since I'm uh, I'm I'm talking right now, maybe I get the first question. So. Um, <laughs> Is there a frequency dependence to this effect? Yes, there is. That's a good question. Um, yeah, so we did uh, look at that um, as well. And it's in the supplement of my paper. <laughs> uh, you'll see the frequency dependence, but the frequency dependence becomes less so, like the higher frequency you go. It, uh, there's a stronger okay. effect on like longer periods. Um, and, does, and does the effect go to zero when you go to infinite frequency? Oh, uh, I can remember. Uh, you might have to check the original Schneider paper. Yeah. Um, that's a good. I don't. I don't know. Uh, I just can't remember. Okay. Top of my head. Yeah. That's a good question. Okay. Um, but yeah, at least I like with my paper, I gave like a code to calculate it, and for the ten second period, it's it's good. So it does matter which like frequency range you're using. Mm -hmm. um, so because it's very expensive to do these simulations less than nine seconds. So, so I didn't do very many um, less than that. So that would just require some, a couple of simulations at higher frequency, but just to check and then check the original paper. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any other questions? Feel free to just uh just just shout out anything. Yeah, I know. It's a lot of seismology. <laughs> a lot of nerdy body waves. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask another one while people come up with questions. Yeah. Um so like um I think this is this is really interesting, sort of how you found this. It's sort of um yeah. through through these 3D simulations. And um I'm sort of wondering, do you think this would have been found through other ways? Like did well, I, I guess there was there was the other study by the um the other author at Colorado School of Mines. Yeah. Like, was this originally found through observations or was it found through, um, you know, someone having a hypothesis and then testing it? How, how was it originally found? Yeah, it was really because 
I wanted to make sure that there was no transverse component energy because that's like such a big assumption. And so I was just seeing like, oh, could like heterogeneity like cause the, and heterogeneity does cause polarization anomalies. It's just the rotation effect is a little stronger. And yeah, it was really just by accident. I don't know mm. why no one noticed it. I think because it's, it can be really small. Yeah. And as you saw with S, like the amplitude differences are really small. Like you take a good eye to notice. <laughs> and it's only because I was just testing every possible combination. And it's just because I turned off rotation. And that mm. was just one of the things I was looking at. Um, so, but the theory was already developed. So yeah. we're like, which was very convenient for me. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, so I think some people have got their hands up. Gabby, why don't you take it? Take ahead. Yeah. So traditionally, and I am um, familiar with with some of Fool's uh, work. So traditionally, um, the theory actually predicts that the Coriolis um, coupling or the Coriolis effect. Um, gets ever smaller as you go. So I'm from the normal mode um, yeah. and spectrum and the effects get smaller as you go up in frequency. And Ruhl did do some work on surface waves and then the German group um, was also involved in this. And yeah, yeah, they did work on long period surface waves. And I'm yeah. a little intrigued that now this is also apparently um, predicted by theory at you know relatively short period uh, body waves, but I I I do wonder if only the polarization is affected by this. So this would be my first question. Um, but also, have you looked at travel time effects? Um, um, and. I mean, the other thing, I had lots and lots of questions, but, you know, as your talk progressed, you actually um, addressed all of the other possible sources why your um, polarization could be off by a little bit. And yeah, of course, it could be the station misalignment, the horizontal components, but then also um, topography, and you addressed it, um, on a core mental boundary because that can actually in um <laughs> since since yeah you were at Yale I mean um uh Jeff Park worked on that um that to yeah. topography can actually cause some Rayleigh love uh coupling as well and then that would actually influence your particle motion as well so have you looked at uh, travel time anomalies caused by that I didn't see any travel time differences, um, but like on the radial components. I, I didn't. It was really just amplitude. Um, so I didn't actually measure the travel time. So that's that's a good point. I, I didn't measure them. I just didn't notice anything significant. But it's like that's something I could do is like just do the cross correlation to see if there's even just a minuscule like difference. So yeah, I didn't look at that. It's a good suggestion. I mean, I could imagine that, yeah, you can, you know, I mean, it's such a subtle uh, signal that, yeah, maybe you can see it in a polarization, but maybe not in travel time. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't have a feel for that, but I could, I could, I could be convinced that that's the case. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Gabrielle, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I was I was trying to think uh, during your talk about, well, I was, I, this is somewhat outside of, of my uh, area of expertise, to say the least. Um, so I was curious to hear you comment on what other, whether you would consider this difference that you that you get as a result of this effect to be uh, an uncertainty and, and what other types of uncertainty you might you might be seeing, how it sort of compares um to those like like the real is, sks polarization yeah so I, you know you said you didn't have any noise but i guess i i try and think about you know how far things are above above the noise level or above um, other types of uncertainty yeah. and i was just yeah curious to hear you give a bit more detail about yeah that. i was saying because i did look at that in my paper i just didn't talk about in this talk because most mm -hmm. uncertainties of polarization are about a degree or so okay um so you know 
I think it would be hard to see it in the data, but I think with a large enough data set, you would see it. And I did look at that with the like the 10,000 measurements or so. And one fortunate aspect is that a lot of that data was collected at the TA array. And I didn't point this out, but the average of all of the wall pull measurements is not zero. It's actually shifted by about two degrees from the mean. And I calculated what the rotation effect would be for like those paths and it was two degrees. And so there was like, I, there was a directional impact because they had so many ray paths coming from like Tonga, Japan to the TA array and they're all like two degrees. So there was a shift in the mean. So I think with a large enough data set, I think you could see it. Lots of events, okay. lots of TA station, yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah. What what's the TA array? Oh, the TA array was like this really dense uh, seismic array and that was all across North America. And oh, it was like okay. 70 kilometers station spacing. So you could get one earthquake and get tons of measurements like really close in space. And so it, it's biasing their polarization measurements. Um, okay. At least that histogram I showed. Yeah, so there is an offset. I just didn't really talk about it. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I was just curious. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Excellent. Any more questions? I have one. Um, you know, when we put seismometers on other planets, do we need to think about this as well? Yeah, that's actually something I kind of explored in mm. my postdoc was I wanted to see if you could change the rotation of the planet. And you can. You can change its speed. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can, I think it would. Um, definitely if it has a different like daytime then because if it's spinning faster, uh, the anomaly is bigger. Mm. Um, or if it's slower, yeah. So, it it is related. Um, and I think that I don't know how it affect. It might change the frequency dependence though for sure. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And do you think that sort of um you know, as we get more and more data and as our sensors get more um, sensitive and, you know, hopefully our data gets higher quality, do you think this will be a sort of more, uh, you know, critical correction to be made? Because you, you, you said that, you know, um, this this does produce an apparent splitting, of, but it's like less than 0.2 no. seconds. There's no but... apparent splitting, no. Okay. It's just a misalignment. So the misalignment, you can, okay. You can correct for it. Okay. Um, it it's a really easy correction in series splitting if there's a misalignment. Um, mm -hmm. just like rotate your fast direction. Mm -hmm. So it's not that bad. Um, you just can't use the linear minimization method if you're like if your misalignment is greater than five degrees. Right. Then right. your measurement gets all wonky. Right. Um. So what we normally do is we just rotate the seismogram so that the polarization is like matching up back azimuth and then we'll correct that rotation on the fast direction sometimes or we'll do some other we can do some like make sure that's right you know mm -hmm. with our correction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so oh, what was your original question i kind of got lost there oh no i just remember on one of your slides that you sort of um i'm forgetting exactly what it was but it was you, you did a load of synthetic calculations yeah. and you showed that some anomaly was below 0.2 seconds. I can't remember exactly what measurement you were making now, but you were saying oh, that the it... splitting time. Yeah, it was really small. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's going to be some like error, like anything less than half a second is fine. Yeah. Oh, but that that's a sort of uncertainty that comes from like mantle heterogeneity or something. Well, no, it's just um, typically like because it's like the periods we're working with. Uh, ah, like 10 okay. seconds so mm -hmm. anything less than half a second it just it almost looks like a null so it's just kind of our our arbitrary yeah. cutoff that okay. we use um but that's why sometimes we use like other metrics that aren't so sensitive to that like splitting intensity mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. because it's more sensitive to that like half a second range like you can at least see uh, an isotropy like increasing you know you can see it with yeah. the relative because the cutoff is not like the best approach but it's mm -hmm. the one that we mainly use it's yeah. not great but you have to like kind of cut it off somewhere now for like local shear splitting when we're using higher frequencies our cutoff will be a lot lower right yeah like how do you share splitting in like res underground reservoirs and it's like our delay times are like milliseconds so our wow. cutoff, okay. a lot a okay. lot lower yeah, yeah. 
but then so, the Coriolis effect would hopefully not <laughs> impact there at all. <laughs> not at all. Good. Uh, so yeah, the Coriolis is really just has to be like accumulating for, I think I did the math. It's, it has to be accumulating at least for a couple of minutes mm -hmm. of travel time. Um, and S wave was the largest anomaly, like eight degrees, I think was the max. And that's, mm -hmm for like the longest, like 80 degrees S wave, but it's not, it's not really perfect because the ray is bending. So the ray is changing relative to the Earth's rotation axis, like consistently along. The yeah. So, it's like an integrated, integrated effect. Yeah. So some are tough, hard, like little segments are not impacted at all. And then some are really a lot. And then if you're going over like a pole, mm -hmm. it can be reversed. You can, your polarization normally can be zero actually. Mm -hmm. Because it negates itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's why it's like, it's not, it's, it depends on the path. Yeah. With the surface waves, they go along the surface, it's easy, but the, the bending of the rays. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. All right. Any, any last questions in the few minutes we have left? I have just really technical questions. Yeah. Um, anyway, thanks for the very interesting talk. I was curious how how costly is it to run SpecFem global simulations? Sure. To do your research? Uh, yeah, so I would definitely recommend using an HPC. Um, so for like 17 second simulations, uh, it's hard to, I think, I think I used like two cores at the time or like two nodes and it takes like 30 minutes to run. So it's pretty fast, but these like nine seconds. So it's not like linear, like the computational cost is not linear, it's, like exponential. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember how long each one took. They, they are long, they take a long time. I'd say like, I think they took about six hours on 600 cores. Yeah, so I oh, used wow. 600 cores. It took anywhere from like three to six hours. Like, yeah, like three to six hours. Like sometimes the 3D models take a little longer. And then to do the kernel simulations, because you have to do the adjoint, I think that in total took 12 hours and 600. Yeah. So I they, think that's expensive. <laughs> yeah, compared to the 17 second, I think you can mm. use like a like 100 cores. It's like done in 30 minutes. Um, but that's too low period to isolate SKS and SKKS. No, the 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 waveforms just get too wide. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. so. Even ten seconds was almost not low enough. Ideally, I would have gone down to five seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we're on the hour. So let's uh, thank our speaker again. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, let me stop the.